You're listening to Robin Flan's Drummer Interviews, the number one drum radio show in all of Los Angeles. The world. The galaxy. <laughs> I'm Robin Flans, and this is Robin Flans Drummer Interviews. And this interview is sponsored by EPad Practice Pads, the only drum practice pad made with Enduraflex playing surface. And I'm here with my co host and cohort, Ed Eblen. Happy 5th of July, everybody. And it is a happy day because today we are joined. By Nashville studio giant Eddie Bears. And, oh boy, get ready for a very long list. And it's only just a partial list of the people this person has worked with. It's his own personal Grammy Award. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what, I mean, and, and not just, I mean, because when I say Nashville studio giant, I mean, he, he's played every style. And, okay, so, okay, here comes the names. There's Dolly and Vince Gill and Ricky Skaggs and George Strait and Reba McIntyre and Alabama and Randy Travis and Waylon Jennings and the Judds, Newgrass Revival, Bob Seeger and the Silver Bullet Band, Alan Jackson, Martina McBride, Peter Cetera, Clint Black, Mark Knopfler, Carl Perkins, John Fogarty, Toby Keith, Delbert McClinton, Winona, Garth Brooks, uh, I'm and talk- that was just yesterday. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm tired. So, okay, enough is enough. I'm sure there will be more names mentioned. In fact, I'm going to mention another one right now because, Eddie, I noticed that one of your earliest clients was Willie Nelson, and he's also one of your most recent. I'm yep, t- that's true. So... Boy, how well he was. Yeah, he was several of my most recent. I think, <laughs> I think he's he's probably the most recorded artist now, even at his age, to have more frequent albums in the past five years than I've ever worked with. So, so yeah, how do you keep a client like that for that many years? What? How do you keep a client like that for that many years? Well, he, you know, the interesting thing is, is that every project is unique in itself. And uh, he's still writing. And actually, uh, the one before the last one called Band of Brothers, mm. uh, I went out two weeks because they wanted to promote the record. So I went out. I had to do that. Wow. And we we went to New York and we went to Connecticut. I mean, we did like the Dave Letterman show at that time. Uh, And we did ESPN, of all things, and we did the QVC situation. And I have to say that like the QVC, they do one-on-one interviews for every song. (gasps) And as much as I've known Willie over all these decades... I mean, every one of them, he was just so on top of all all the the questions asked and, and his answers and everything. I, I, I've i never heard him so in-depth, you know, so, with, Eddie, with the knowledge of it. Musically, what was that project like? Well, you know, everything that Willie does, I mean, obviously there's a stereotype with his voice floating around on meter and his guitar, uh, that's sort of famous too you know like starting down from lower registers you know dun, 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 you know all that <laughs> but but the thing is is i got noticing over the years his his voice is like an improvisation yeah. i mean he's he's like he's like a jazz artist you yeah. know over the top and uh but just everything everything was so fulfilling you know well, uh, every that, time that... i've ever that that brings me to the question. I mean, he between his guitar style and his vocal style, he has a timing all his own. How do you serve 
him playing the drums. I mean, the time element has to be interesting with Willie Nelson. Yeah. Had, ha, tell me. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just an, uh, an interesting study, you know, uh, that w- when you work for somebody so many years and you see how unique he is, even comparatively, obviously, we work with a lot of credible vocalists and instrumentalists that are just right on the mark and play what they play. And then you got somebody like Willie who's just free. I mean, you don't, free spirit. you don't work with fits. a click. Do, Every, you don't work with a click, do you? He what? You don't work with a click, do you? With Willie. Huh? With Willie? Yeah. I, uh, I'm sorry, I had to hear that again. I didn't, I don't, what? You don't work with a click with yeah, Willie, Yeah, she, she's do saying, you? do you? No, no, oh, God, no. No. That would be... Well, that's what I mean. So how do oh, you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. No, I there's mean, no. How do you follow you, his time? Well, because the one thing I've acclimated to, as you know, over the decades you and I have known each other, uh, through all different projects, there are some artists that you you can do that with and some that you can't do that with. And it's not that you couldn't do it with Willie, but you wouldn't want to. Mm. And then there's other artists that you do it with that could do it, and you don't want to do it with them either, you know, because that you want that freedom. Right. Because they're such great vocalists uh, that you want to follow that. And and it makes its own time from there. And uh, that's that's what I love, you know, especially about Willie. And it wasn't a situation where saying, no, you couldn't do that. I mean, he could. There, there's been projects before where we did click it. Really? As a matter of fact, he, yeah, and he would ask. He'd say, why don't, why don't you put a click on this one? And so we would, but... but Eighty percent of them, no. It, it would depend on the song. Interesting, because I, I just, yeah. I'm, I'm so intrigued with his time that I would just think he would could be a drummer's nightmare. Yeah, he can. <laughs> he can. He, yeah, he. Yeah. <laughs> but but he's a free he's a free spirit yeah. and. Uh, one thing I've always done is that for my longevity, it, it's been able to take a great artist and work with them with that capacity of being able that they lead me. I follow them. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to be Mr. Metronome or Mr. Time, even without a click, to make sure that I adhere to what I think that is. I, I let the, the voice lead me on, and I follow it. And it all works out, okay. you know, when you hear it back. Yeah. And, and it, you know, you started out as a keyboard player. Do you think, yep. I mean, well, there's a couple questions here. I mean, do you think that plays into any part of you as a drummer? I mean, is that a piece of who you are? Well, there, there's there's others that say that, that they feel, you know, that, it's made me play more musical than rhythmical Mm -hmm. and that's just their testimony on circumstances like that and uh i i guess i can understand that one thing that i would always advocate that it's always good especially if you're in a rhythmic instrument such as drums it really does help you to understand piano or guitar or something that has to deal with the chords you know with the with the uh music right because because that way when you're reading a chart you're you're actually understanding the chords that are written there and if it's notated music you can read the notated music and play to that you know and it it does make a difference you know on on the performance aspect of it and I would think and, uh, it also, yeah, and it, I mean, you understand the song structure and and how, and how it also affects how you hear a song. Absolutely. I would think it, it, yeah. it really helps. Well, as you know, I mean, through my years, anybody that knows anything in my beginnings, like Garth did on his uh, Man Against Machine record, there was no, it was the one before that we did, uh, the Blame It On My Roots, and there were some 
retro songs that he wanted to go back and visit. He had genres that he honored throughout right. the, that whole project. Right. <laughs> and so there was one that uh, I think it was a song by Bad Company or what the song was Bad Company, or whatever. But anyway, he wanted me to put the piano on it, which I did. Mm. And and then about three weeks ago, I was doing a project with Janine Van Zant, who is uh, was uh, it was the wife of Towns Van Zant, great mm. writer. Mm. And she she found some masters that uh, were done on him from like Alan Reynolds and. Uh, uh, Jack, uh, Cowboy Jack, and wow. and so they were just they were well recorded. Though. They were vocal and guitar. So we went in for two days, and she put other instruments on, and then I put the drums on there for two days. And uh, ironically, the, the 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 producer and her said, "We know of your keyboard. <laughs> uh, do, you wouldn't happen to have an old DX7?" <laughs> wow. I said, wow. I know. We all know. Anybody that understands retro keyboards, I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. Oh, my gosh. And they still said, had one. would you bring it tomorrow? Yeah, would you bring it tomorrow? And I said, greatly, uh, with the new virtual instruments, I have the DX7 encompassed with all the other retro keyboards. You know how <laughs> they do with plugins. So I brought that in, and I put the DX7 on the cut that they wanted. And then they said, uh, are you... Uh, do you have any more sessions tonight? And I said, no. They said, we want you to put the keyboards on all the rest of the songs. So Woo! I wound up putting, yeah, I wound up putting keyboards on all 13 songs. And uh, I just got the Masters back uh, probably two or three days ago, and it's a wonderful record. It's just well done, just well done, and really holding true to Towns. And uh, I just I just enjoyed that. It's just some of the off-the-beaten-path records that you do, you know. Very cool. Well, some of those are the most uh, creative and and enjoyable. That's very cool. Yes, very cool. Yep. Um, you know, I wanna, I wanna, for those who might not know, the the backstory on keyboards and then the evolution to drums. It was it was Larry London who encouraged you to, um, play the drums. In yep. in Nashville, and you know, <laughs> why was he so welcoming of the competition? Well, you know, I wasn't competition at first. You know, when I came in town, uh, I was like any other struggling musician, and uh, but I had friends here, and I remember just you know, as you make your way and try to make a living, and. Uh, Interestingly enough, I heard about an audition down at Carousel Club at Printer's Alley, and there was a quartet down there. So I was in line with all the other keyboard players, and <clears throat> all of a sudden, the big old burly drummer Larry London came up and said, you're my guy. <laughs> so he hired me. So I played keyboards with him for about a year and a half, wow. and we really, we became close. And, of course, I was inspired by him, and who wouldn't be, mm. or wouldn't have been. Mm. And... uh I remember him uh, telling me, he said, I just said, boy, I would love to be able to do that. Now, this is almost like six months into our time together. Mm. And uh, he actually got me on some sessions, playing piano with him. And, uh, I mean, he just nurtured it. You know, and I think, uh, you know, Larry wasn't one that was intimidated by anything. If, if, if the word competitive came in, I think he was, well, fitted in his genes you know he yeah. he yeah he knew of his talent and he knew of his worth and uh he wasn't interested in competition you know right. it would right when the factor with him he was a very giving soul but then on the other side he could be the other way if you were the other way well sure if you if you crossed and, and, him he wasn't gonna take it <laughs> no 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 so he he um but he nurtured me in that way and i remember him uh, because we were a quartet that played in between shows of main, uh, headliners that were in the club. And so we would go upstairs. He had his little practice pad up there. And he said, let me show you this. Let me show you that. And then after a period of time, I said, Larry, I said, you know, I, I've been being classically trained. I've been in an interpretive mode all my life. And I think I just want to beat these things. <laughs> so he, he, he showed me what we consider yeah. meat and potatoes. And, uh, 
After about a year and a half, I heard about an audition from a top 40 band down the street. And uh, so I went and auditioned, and I got that job. Huh. And through that, then I was able to pursue what anybody else would hear, and that's what's the studio scene, you know? And so I heard about a new studio opening up, and I walked in the door there, and they weren't ready for business. But simultaneously, another guy came in named Paul Worley, um, and uh, he's a known producer sure, at Evers We Know, sure. of his worth, and... So him and I started there together. We said, you don't pay us until you can, which they were able to pay us after a while. And after about eight years, uh, Paul became such a known producer. He said, uh, I- I've got to have my own place because uh, this place doesn't give me enough time. And so I said, well, with some of my uh, investments and stuff, I have a building downtown that we could convert it to our studio, which we did. We rightly named it the Money Pit, and uh, <laughs> we had it for 27 years. So... Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you weren't really a drummer before you came to Nashville. Yeah, no. You know, and I can only say that during uh, your, your when, when people are in formative time, I mean, I know other drummers that are keyboard players or, or vice versa, and I know guitar players that play keyboards or, or drums or something. You know, we all diversify. You know, just because the music right. that that we that we love so much that's instilled, and there are just facets of it that, as we are going along our journey, you know, we we want to know about that. We would like to do that. Mm-hmm. Then it just turns out that maybe one or the other is how you're making your living. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I I was actually in drums before. No, actually, part of my interim of. Uh, coming out of classical in Oakland, California, and I uh, got to know a guy, uh, Tom Fogarty, who was John Fogarty's brother, which is in Credence. Right. And he he had a little group that would work around town, and we, we would do, uh, he had already estranged himself from his brother. That, all that kind of blew up. Salt Ants kind of blew the, 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 the group up, but Anyway, Tom would put a little group together, and I would go in in midnight times at Fantasy Studios, and I'd play piano with him, and a guy named Billy Cole on drums, Merle Saunders on keyboard. He would play guitar, and uh, Jerry Garcia oh, play guitar. Oh, right. Yeah, so I would jam with them. But then during that time, too, I would frequent, there was a black club downtown on uh, Telegraph Avenue, and... uh so I would go down there and hang out, just list the love of the soul and the bands and stuff like that. And this, the the club owner came up and said, "Hey, we got a gospel group coming in here that uh, need a drummer to work with them." And I said, "Man, I, I'd love to do that." And it turned out to be the Edwin Hawkins Singers. Uh... So uh, there was a set of drums up there. I played with them, and they they felt that man, I just fit right in with their family. And asked if I wanted to join the family, and I did. Wow. So, uh, uh, yeah, I toured with the Edward Hawkins Singers for the rest of those years. Wow. Th- there, and, uh, of course, that was on drums. And then then coming back to Nashville in late 73, 74, then I switched over to piano again. So you were just... After with Larry. Yeah, and you were just one of those ta- talented kind of guys who could just do both things. Well, you know, it it was all just rising to the occasion, you know, and I can't say one way or the other, although I didn't have any uh, anticipation about anything. I mean, I was more in line with anybody else. I mean, I love to play the music, but I really love being able to pay bills and put food on the table, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Understood. Yeah, and it worked out. It worked out just fine. So, you know, I want to I want to ask you, um I want to get real frank here. I a lot of people don't look at the Nashville recording scene as very creative. And I would like you to pick sort of I don't know, if you could paint a picture of the normal session. I, I mean, I I'm sure it varies somewhat from artist to artist, but for a long period of time, there was a real, I don't know, rap about 
You just get them in, get them out. Uh, talk to me about what, what, Tell me about that. Well, I, I, I'd have to justify that because it's, it's almost like if you want a comparative, even in a sports arena. And when the players are out there playing, they have spent a lot of preamble practicing, practicing, mm. you know, camps. They learn all their moves. They learn everything that they're going to be doing. When they're out there and the whistle blows, they're on and they perform. Mm. So that interim of time, by the time that they either play their nine innings or their four quarters, you know, or their their, their two halves in basketball, whatever, they have already groomed themselves for that. They've already practiced. So then it's a matter of performing, which obviously we're not in competition in there, but my analogy is when we go in a studio, the producer has already gotten with the writer or the artist. They already know the songs they want to do. They either have a work tape or a demo that they want to play us. The rest of it is, for us, to either follow their instruction, they might say parts of this work tape or demo we like, but we would like it to follow this kind of inspiration, et cetera. So it, there is expediting, right. but the expediting has to deal with quality because, again, we're given the game. We're already given the game. They've done their homework. We can go in there now and count it off and perform it. Right. And so, but they're not asking for much of your input is my point. What yeah, no no, they, they they I have to say, because of the freedom that we're given, because everyone, especially over the decades that I've been here, that's known, uh they they depend on us for that freedom, no different than they would me in what kind of feel would you want for this? Or they might say you know, we do want this dynamic. We want it to start off, you know, low key, first verse, low key, first chorus, not as big, turn around, second verse, big, uh, second chorus, much bigger, bridge big, solo big, whatever, breakdown at the end of it, whatever. But those are maybe dynamic instructions that you get. But as far as the performance aspect of it, of to how you might address that by a feel, a lot of that is your, in my world, would be me working with the bass player. And uh, we have several different uh, uh, ideas about what kind of feel the song is. And if they have an inspiration for a song, they could let us hear that. If they want it like right. this or like that, you right. know, that's easy enough. Um, but the rest of it really comes down to performing. And I'd say more in the instrument stage. When it comes to great guitar players and keyboard players and things of that nature, you know, they, they're really given freedom, you know, as far as, you know, the keyboard part, you know, right. and how fluid they are within what they're doing. And, and certainly the effort kind of says it all. And as you know, you've seen the progression and everything up to now where we're dealing with a lot of program loops and uh, <laughs> in some cases I'm, I'm programming the loops and the drums right so right yeah but you know all that's part of the part of what's going on right and that that's what they're writing these days and to me it's always a matter that you know they call you you didn't call them and i go in and i'm not going to stifle myself and and look at it and try to critique it and say well that's that's not how when we used to have a full band in there and we did everything like this, you know. How how into that have you gotten? I mean, I know like like Keith Urban's last album was a lot of looping and and stuff. I mean, I know Matt Chamberlain did a lot of you yeah. know junk like that. And pardon my yeah, he did. As a matter yeah. of fact, he has his own little apparatus that he helped uh, invent a device. I mean, you almost have to go back to college to learn. Yeah, it. I know. So it's, so it's really. Yeah. I know it's intense, but it it is so good. I mean, what the what he's coming out with is creative. You know. So so how you know how much into the electronic um, stuff have you had to get into throughout you know the your career? It's about fifty fifty. Hmm. You know, it, it's, of course, if, if I'm going in with specific artists that are 
uh, their their own selves, and they're not governed by a specific label that is looking for the next so and so. Right. And they've already made their mark, or their Americana, or you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they're just basically free. Then you don't have to be concerned with that. Right. You know, they they may want a little bit of a, a electro in there, and that's fine. But for the most case, they still want the old, uh, yeah. you know, analog everything, yeah. and uh, there is that. So it's a, it's a matter of, like you said, it's a matter of artist, right, right. When you get in, and uh, so it's, uh, and some of it, it's it can be diverse. But as you know, with it still comes to so-called mainstream, you know, uh, with radio being at the forefront from billboard or anything like that they're still adhering to what is current right. in their minds right and most of that is particularly that type it, it right. is that style right you know the sound right yeah well on that note we're gonna we're gonna take just a a moment a momentary break and we're gonna let ed talk about uh the um what? What am I going to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> By the Whatever way, Eddie, you want. Uh, <laughs> well, no, you. I have a burning question for you when I'm done oh. with this little infomercial thing. Okay, I'm gonna do well, here. you're going to the, uh, the 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 e pad who is sponsoring this wonderful interview. That would be me. And you know, the funny thing is, Eddie, that the reason that I'm doing this, just doing it live, is because I actually have this little commercial on a cart thing. That I would normally just play and I wouldn't have to talk it through. But as these things sort of go, uh, can't find it. It just sort of disappears out of this card system. And so every now and again, I I just have to do it live. So forgive me. I'll be as professional as I can. (laughs) And uh, but but the thing I just want to tell, you know, the people that are listening, especially obviously the drummers that I do manufacture, you know, drum practice pads. I've been doing it for I think we're God, maybe it's like 15 or has over 15 years, Robin? Yep. It yeah. Like, it's a, it's seems, a long time. Seems like 16, but it's only been 15. <laughs> and um, I just want to tell everybody, if they're interested, the concept of the pad is that it's not a gum rubber. It's not the, the quarter-inch 45 durometer gum that's pretty standard. But I do a 5 8 inch Enduraflex, which is more sort of like the feel of a rack tom. And in some instances, maybe a floor. Slower rebound. If you let the stick just drop on the pad, you'd be lucky if you'd pull, you know, two to three rebounds out of it on its own so it is a slower surface much easier on the joints the tendons the muscles because it absorbs the shock of playing and i don't know how right. how hard guys practice or if they're rock players and they really lay into these other pads that have a ton of rebound you know it can be it, it can become an issue but i just want to say that you can go check out my products at epadco.com so that's www.epadco.com also have a facebook which is e dash practice pad on Facebook, and I've got an offer right now for anybody who is interested in buying an EP12, which is a 12-inch circular, uh, you know, uh, e pad with the five eighths and Duraflex surface. But I'm also attaching a, a great book that was written by Maria Martinez, a great, fantastic drummer who authored this book for Hal Leonard, which features exercises for the e pad specifically, and that actually comes free with the purchase of an EP12. So uh, you can see that that special is on the Facebook page. So if you go to e-practicepad.com, you will see, uh, or e-practicepad on Facebook, you'll see and you can take advantage of that. So I will say that I'm going to turn it over to Robin because she's going to plug a couple of her, (laughs) uh, a couple of, are these QVC things you're selling today? Plug, 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 plug. 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 Okay. We Um, don't want to keep Eddie waiting. Well, uh uh-oh couple of websites um one is robin flans drummer interviews.com where you can uh, get my classic interviews which are basically perhaps interviews you might have read only in their original audio form um and they're uncut so you might not have seen all of those interviews and you certainly never heard them so you get to hear Jeff Percaro and Larry London and Ed Shaughnessy, and you get to hear them laugh and breathe and be goofy. And, um, and what's that website? And that's, that's 
robinflansdrummerinterviews.com and it's just remarkable to get these to get to hear it's just such a different experience than reading it in black and white on a page so um, you might want to check those interviews out and um, also want to mention my new media website um, where you I'm offering up writing services for bios and press releases and liner notes and newsletters and um, you can check out samples of my writing and if you're if you're not familiar with me at um, www.robinflansmedia.com so check that out as well and enough of that garbage yes and but can I can I ask Eddie a question you may now that ask he's back Eddie, Eddie I have a question for you because you, because you I guess started out as a keyboard player right then when you made the transition to also in, include the drums does your uh, like viewpoint or opinion of how you look at the drums, was that sort of swayed by being a keyboard player first as opposed to a guy that just starts on drums and that's, you know what I mean? Do you look at, when you were working with Larry London, obviously he was a great player, as as you are too, but I'm just saying, like, how do you view a drummer when you're talking about, you know, getting instructions on a session for making choruses big or a certain verse? I mean... You actually look at those things differently than just being a drummer. You know what I mean? I'm sorry to convolute this, but I'm just trying. No, to... no, I understand. I understand what you're saying. I, it, to me, it's it's all about, of course, the song. Right. If you, if you don't have that, you don't have nothing to play. But uh, by that, it's being sensitive to the music. Uh, if it is music that has a meaning, or if it's just a music's for fun, or uh, whatever style or type it is a lot of times the one thing that i'd look at is not as much the uh how they're treating the style but but how or how are they fitting in and a lot of that there's a naturalness about performing right and it's almost like and you can relate to this ed i mean if we went back and listened to the great al jackson oh sure believe me yeah, anybody else would say, oh, I mean, just boom, back, boom, back, boom. I mean, they think, oh, well, that's that's nothing. But not, it, it, it is something when you can groove like he grooves. Right. It's funny you would even mention that because for whatever reason, the other night I was watching a bunch of Al Jackson YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. It just But you get riveted by the thing. And then, you know, you just sit there for, for an hour and a half and time goes by. He was, he was absolutely... And, uh, amazing, and some of those guys when they play, and especially when they're they're not playing fills, they're playing like melodies or almost call and answer parts to to what's already going on. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a it's an interesting study, and it's uh, it, it's uh, to me because when I look at it, I don't know why, and I, I would think even with you and Robin both, you would be able to hear specific candidates and know. Man, they, they they are grooving. They yeah. are mm-hmm. they are playing the song, you mm-hmm. know, because you feel it. You mm-hmm. can feel it. You you don't know why, but it's something that's inside of you when you hear them play. There's just something natural, and it's in the center of the beat, uh, the center of the song. And there's just again, it's just something that you can't really analyze. Yep. No, you and just, it's you it's, feel it. You yeah. just feel it. It's it just it's a groove. Yep. Yeah, but the per- the perfect combination of all those things for me. I'm just going to compliment you here, and then I'll shut up, Robin, so you can have your show back. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, I want to say one of the uh, what you recorded with Michael Johnson, right? Yeah. Was that yeah. not you? You yes. played on that track. That's that. Oh my correct? god. Correct. And. Great track. Yeah. That was you, right, Eddie? Yes. Can you hear him? I don't think Yeah, that... yeah I hear him. Oh, that's okay, okay. That. No, I'm just saying when you did the when you played That's That with Michael Johnson, that was such a perfect combination of knowing what to do at the right time and the way you structured the fills really just made them explosive. You're coming in and out of the song and the things that you played at the time. It's still, of all the things you've done, and they're great, but I'm just saying that track for me just sort of sends me over there the top. Was, there was another well, that, song that, on that 
there was another song on that al- album that you blew me away with, and I can't think of the name of it. Let, let, well, the the one that uh, the one that was on that same album, I think, was "Give Me Wings." That was a uh, oh, I mean, he yeah. Had a, he, yeah. But but the thing about that's so that getting back to that yeah. is, is you Presswood who who wrote the song. Uh, in fact, he booked me on his record because of that song, the way I treated his song. Mm. Yeah. And, and he was asking, he was saying, you know, because you give a certain uh, hint of a feel throughout most of the song, but then when you break out with the Tom feels, you turn into a whole different feel. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, it, it turns the song totally around. Right. And, and uh, he said, what, 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 where, where did that come from? <laughs> what was that? You know? Yeah. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, when when we were discussing at the end, uh, Brent Mayer, the producer, was talking, you know, it would be great to have some kind of big Tom Phil and just then start playing the song out bigger than what it is. And yeah. I just started thinking of Phil Collins. Mm. Ah. Yeah, well, yeah. that would make sense, sure. You know, like, dick, 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 all that, you know, and... But then what happened was, after I got through with the fill, I said, well, the fill doesn't match the feel of the song I've been in, but it turned into what it did. <laughs> wow. So it, was, it, was a, it was a happy accident, you know, as it was. So you got, they, but, gave, you, they gave you publishing on that song. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, unfortunately, we don't, we don't have that luxury. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that'll change. Well, I just wanted to say that, and, and now, Robin, I'll, I'll well, be quiet. Well, that actually leads right into my... My next question was, what have been some of the more creative sessions? You mean like that? Yeah. I'm, you know, what, maybe that. You know what? Yeah. Well, there, there, are, there are, the most creative were always with, again, the artists that had control of their own artistry. Mm. And one being Mark Knopfler. Ah. Yeah, when I did Golden Heart, I mean, I hadn't worked with Mark before, but he was so in-depth. And anybody else would say, oh, my God, you know, he just takes so much time and all that. But but it was all necessary time, and it all made sense for the time you spent, Mm -hmm. you know, in learning his song. And he was very meticulous about the parts and how he wanted everyone to perform on the song. And so you pretty much had a good instruction and inspiration from him to do it. But every song was just like, you know, because it was, they were they were his songs. I mean, and he was very uh, loving of each one of those songs. So you spent that time till it was the way he wanted it to be. And it was really meaningful by the time you got to being able to give it a take, you know. Nice. Well, that's what I was and, saying before, is that sometimes in Nashville, and not just Nashville, I mean, it's, it's in any recording situation, it's sort of like, you know, one and done. I mean, it's like, just just do it. You know, let's just get it done. But, yeah, when, when, they, when people take the time to, you know, give it the care and, and try different yes. things, that's when it is the most creative. Well, and that, that, well, you know, you're absolutely right. It doesn't matter what the effort is, whether it's a program loop or whether mm-hmm. it's a, a big ballad or anything like that. Yes, the, 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 the artist... And the producer who have picked the material that they want on this project, that they do, they do take the time to to uh, you know look at every contribution they can get from the group, mm-hmm. and uh, and so yeah, there's a definite creative process going on. And I mean, as you know, too, over the years, how a lot of producers will go, well, you know, we you guys really produced it, you know, right, and and. Uh, it is a production team, but, you know, somebody uh, takes the lead like that, and uh, mm-hmm. that's all well and good. That's how we've all made our living over these years, and so it's, it's accepted. But we do realize the process. They realize the process. And as they have created chemistry over the years, it also creates your longevity. Or sure. not yours, but mine or anybody else involved in that process. Sure. And there, yeah, there definitely is. Uh, obviously, if anybody wants to give stigma to the get in, get out, well, yeah, there's demos. Mm. You know, there's people who go in, and you have to do five or six songs in a session, right. which I do. I'll go in and do that because that's like taking your brain to the gym. <laughs> you know, uh. 
like like one one group that I work with, you, know, you have thirty minutes a song, and uh, you, they do six songs in a session. Who's that? Huh? Who is that? That is they're called Beard Music Group. Wow. And he's been the most successful demo, but not only demo, but also uh, through other people who've had pipe dreams over the years who have come to know his organization so well that they will come in and spend their money and do their project. Because for one thing, the price is right. They can, they can uh, you know, buy two, three-hour sessions, and at the end of the day, they can have 12 songs. Wow. <laughs> or they could have 10 songs, whatever they want. But it's all by mainstream players. We all go in and we do this. Well, and, I guess that's, and, yeah, and, that is. That's like uh, taking a challenge. That's like well, the, that's the what Iron I'm, Man. <laughs> well, you know what? That's what I'm saying, though, Robin. I mean, it, it, it's interesting to go in, and it's amazing uh, yeah. that when you think, well, you've got 30 minutes to do a song. Uh, uh, but it's amazing how within those 30 minutes, the whole band works together. Yeah. Everybody comes to the end result. And in 30 minutes, these people have a track that is competitive. Whew. It's not just like, oh, that sounds like a demo. I mean, it, it's as good as wow. any other record that's out there. Wow. Well, that's when you know you're on your game. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I I guess that's, that's you know, you can pat yourself on the back, but. But you know, let's let's talk about those musical moments for a minute. So, who else? I mean, you've got Mark Knopfler. Who else? Who? Wh- what? What other musical moments in your in your world can you recall? You mean recent or well, just any any that come to mind? Well, obviously, I mean James Taylor was one. Mm. You know, because he was one thing was as being in with him. Yeah, and that great voice and that great talent. Yeah. And uh, working with him was just, uh, you know, it's unique. A lot of times you don't want to seem like you're so awestruck from it, but <laughs> you are in respect of that talent that you've known all your life. Right. And there you are in, in, in the studio working with him. Mm. And uh, very, uh, he's also very overseeing, you know, but it's all by making sense, too. And you appreciate that direction because... It gets more out of you normally that you would have given. I mean, because they are who they are, mm. Mm. you know. And so when I would do projects with him, I mean, it was unique, right. uh, very unique. And, and then I actually went out on a couple of different tours with him, just when he called it his acoustic band. Right. And uh, we went and played festivals and things like that. And that was something of course i wanted to do that i mean to also work with him in that capacity because it was a scaled down right you know right more of an unplugged version of james taylor which to me it fits him better than the electrical right right but but, but the other one uh, uh bob seeger mm. you know i've i've done four albums with him and it's the same thing you know he he's a. Uh, and he's interesting, and Ed, you'd appreciate this. From the drum respect, you would think Bob Seger, big rocker. Right. And, of course, you do rock. You play solid and you rock. But you'd be surprised how things that we think would be the appropriate rock fill going into a course is not what he's looking for. Really? So what is you it? Know, he want, yeah. And, and you can listen to Laws and Records. You'll see. He's very basic when it, what, what he wants. Of course, he wants the feel and he wants the solid. But in a lot of those cases, he doesn't want like some kind of tricky fill going into anything. Hmm. It's yeah, it's very solid. And uh, I now I just learned it after working with him over the years. I would know, you know, you get to know the person, so obviously I know what kind of fill he's going to want in a specific place. Right. Sure. So, but again, you know, the time spent with him <clears throat> again. Certainly, because it's it's Bob Seger, mm. and and again, likened to you know Mark Knopfler or or James Taylor, and uh, another one is John Fogerty. Mm. When I worked on a record with him, that was unique because, mm. and you appreciate this, he was so particular that I had to use. DW drums. It didn't matter what drums I endorsed. I had to use DW. <laughs> really? Wow. And and you do not touch the set. He came in and tuned the set. 
and then you play it. He wow. tuned it personally? <laughs> he personally tuned it? Huh? He personally tuned it or had it tuned? Yeah, no, yeah, no. Well, as you know, through the early years when the Creedence broke up and he did the, what, the, the Rangers record, everything like that, he played drums and everything on it. So he, he's a fluent drummer. I mean, he can play. But he was very meticulous about the tuning of the drums, and uh, he would tune them every day when we came in. He would tune them. Never oh, knew that. I wow, it's interesting. I never knew that. Yeah. No, wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So how, and just out of, uh, what, how would you describe his tuning? Are these well, like. Well, you know, it's, well, it, it's interesting because it's sort of like, <clears throat> like, um, if you heard this track and it kind of had a loose guitar on it and all of a sudden you hear Willie Nelson's voice, it's evident. Right. It's Willie right. Nelson, you know, and the same thing with John. It's sort of like, you could have any drum set out there, but the DWs, this is drums of choice. But when he tuned them, all of a sudden, you know, you, you almost feel like you're playing Creedence, even though they weren't Camco drums like Doug played. But there was a certain uh, vibe that he gave to the drums. And so, plus, as a material, it's pretty similar to what he's written all his life, you know. Right, so he knows that sound. I'm just curious. So I wonder if he's been doing that since Creedence days, or if that was something that fostered, his, like during his own career, if he started tuning drums. That's nah. amazing. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I had I was no different than both of you. I mean, when I first got into L.A. and went in the studio, and I saw the set of drums there, and he basically gave me that. Uh, take that he said oh by the way uh you don't touch any of the tuning i do the tuning <laughs> and the wow. only thing is he looked he looked at the set that that he was given uh, to have but he said the only thing wrong is these are 14 inch hi-hats and i like 15 inch can you get me some fit and of course i've been with zildjian all my life so i yeah you know drove drove down to the zildjian place over up in tour there and uh went in got 15 inch hi-hats and brought them back but that's <laughs> That is so such an odd thing. Yeah, that is so interesting. That's really, really. And funny. what a, I mean, what a testimony to DW. Yeah. Uh, it, although okay. you're not, you're not a DW player, are you? No, I'm not. I uh, actually, you know, my process through the years, uh, and I and I learned it from Larry. Because being with Larry, he was a pearl, and I went with pearl mm -hmm. when I started making some names, and I went with pearl, and then from that. You know, you, you, uh, I never was an endorsement hopper. I didn't get into it for anything free. I needed to, to also look at everything because your, your equipment is also your life, you know? Mm -hmm. and yeah. So, as, so as I would hear about other innovations at that time, uh, I'd heard about Yamaha. So, uh, with my drum company, I said, well, sneak one in on a session and let me hear it. And, at that point in time, it was pretty evident that it was a state of our kit. Mm. Right. So, uh, and I actually even told, uh, who was a uh, uh, Joe Testa, who was the uh, A and R guy at Yamaha at that time. I said, I, I, I almost hated to hear these things. Mm. And he said, Why? I said, Because I, I knew what I had to do. You know. So yeah. I went with Yamaha. So for probably 10 or something years I was there and then they were making some changes and mm -hmm. then one of the changes they made uh, Sakai Rhythm out of Osaka in Japan is who made those kits for Yamaha right, right. oh I didn't and know that they dropped them uh, Yamaha dropped them for whatever reason I don't know but right. uh, uh, Izio the, the owner of Sakai got in touch with me and he said, you know, they've dropped us, but we want you know, we're going to continue on making these drums and we're even going to take a step above with better grains of wood and better hardware, all that stuff like that. And I said, well, um, get, get me a kit, you know? And so they got a kit here and it was everything that he said. And I had to make the unfortunate call to at that time, the people at Yamaha and, <clears throat> tell them that, that I hated to do it, but I have to make the decision, which I did. And so I've been with Sakai yeah, for 
probably three years. Mm. But not, but interestingly enough, now I'm I don't know what their future is because I've heard you know how rumors get around saying oh they're filing for bankruptcy, they're uh, selling yeah, it, no they're boy. doing it. Yeah. You know I don't know that, but I've been talking with the A and R guy, and I'm not hearing anything yet mm. of that being said. But still, the the kit. <clears throat> and I got two of them mm. are still so significant. I mean, they're going to mm. outlast me. Yeah, I did see and, photos of you on the internet with those. I was trying to yeah. figure that out. I didn't know if it was a backline kit for a gig you had done. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting because I've heard of them and I know yeah. of them, but I didn't know their relationship yeah. to Yamaha. Well, yeah. well, also, see that you know, also that, why, that, um, that uh, um, Pearl knowing about this has reached out. Now they're making a whole new line of kits, these masterworks and everything. Mm-hmm. And there's, supposed to be stellar state-of-art kits yeah and so uh i'm supposed to meet up with them but you know i mean at this stage of my life it it's uh it, it's it's a matter of even if they match what i have you know i i don't want to get into a scenario where all of a sudden i'm laden down with you know two more kits right you know and and, and where do i put them <laughs> You know, I mean, right. I don't have them at home. I've got the cartridge company, right. but I don't need right. to. I don't need to laden them with it. Right. But I'll go try them out. But I've heard such incredible talk about them. The right. Masterworks fan. In fact, uh, Shannon Forrest went with them. Right. Oh well. And Shannon's the one who told me mm. about them. He said they're stellar kits. You know. Mm. So. And those are maple maple drums. That's your. Yeah, I think they they have the concoction like anybody else has. They'll have like a maple and with the mahogany covering them. You know. Yeah. It, it's interesting all this layer that they do in drums, and I never was one for that. I always just like the pure wood, like the Sakai I have, or just birch. Right. And uh, and I just went with that, you know. And then I don't like, <clears throat> I didn't like the. Uh, the film that they put around it, it kind of compresses a little bit. You know, the thing that puts a sheen or a sparkle or a color. Mm. Oh, the finished and ply, the, yeah. Ac- actually, yeah, actually, the people at Sakai told me their recommendation was wood. So I just said, do wood and then put a finish on it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I did. And uh, I, I just love the kit. And it, it stands up every time I go into different studios with the prominent engineer. They're always... Praising them. Is so. there? Is there? And, and just I, I know. Right, right, you looking at me like it's like two yeah. guys, two guys shopping for sh- shoes here. But I'm just curious. What what would the traditional recording sizes for you be on a drum kit? Mr. Well, I've always, of course, you know, when you get an endorsement and being fortunate to do that, you know, you always get the 10, 12, 14, 16. Then mm-hmm. there sometimes they're 10, 12, 13, 16. I wasn't always a fan of the 13 inch rack. Yeah, it it never made sense between twelve and thirteen to me, just as far as tuning, you know. Right. And maybe in more of a in more of a percussive playing, it might. But no, uh, and I just love the the uh, even perimeters. You know, I like twelve, fourteen, sixteen, and that's what kind of gets me through everything that I do. I've never really had any call to go any further than that. I mean, I've got the other sizes from ten to eighteen, but. I just never needed them, you know. Right. And what, what's the bass drum? Is it a 20, 22? 24. Oh, 24. Oh, ah, yeah. okay. Tw- and what's what's the depth of that? If it's 24 in diameter, it's 16 or 18? Yeah, I got 16 and 18. Oh, wow. You're playing a double bass kit? No. You just have the option? No, I haven't. I, no, I don't do that. I mean, I, I, I've i done it before, but that was many years ago. But, oh, I'd like to see that. You know, <clears throat> in this day and age, it doesn't really, and most of the stuff I do doesn't call for that. I mean, you can have the double kick pedal. Right. You know, and, right. and make, a, make a lot of the beats a lot easier, as you know. Yeah, yeah, there's always, there's a certain symmetry about that double bass thing. And I love watching, like even Shaughnessy or Simon Phillips, It's a, and they make it all work. You know, it's a cool thing. But, yeah, it's a drag to have to. Well, I found even for even for some of the quick beats, if you're doing quick 16s, like do to get back to that, mm-hmm. that really can really be nice and smooth and even with double kick. Yeah, yeah. With the double pedal. Double pedal, yeah. Yeah, it really works. It works great. All right, so your so your pearl thing is sort of in the it's in the works, right? It's not a definite yet. 
Yeah, right now I've still got to go. Uh, the guy that's ahead of it over there, I think his name is John, he, he said, I just want to make sure everything is at your disposal when you come here because they're actually making them here in Nashville. So, oh, okay. Uh, when, when I go meet with them, I can go and I can go through the whole thing. I'm never going to say no. I mean, I don't, you know, you just don't know till you go. Right. And they're a huge, they make greats. They always did. They're a huge company and they've been, I, well, they originated in Nashville, didn't they? Pearl? I believe. The what now? No, I said Pearl Company originated in Nashville, right? That's their home base. They've always been. You know, they that well probably this uh this side of it. I don't I don't know. I really don't know the history. I know when I was with them, they did everything here. Okay, so cool. So maybe 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 that's true. Maybe it did start here. Well, we'll, I, I, we'll wish the best for Sakai. Hopefully they 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 are are good, but if you but if you make a change with Pearl, you know, congrats on that, man. You can't lose either yeah, way. I'm, it's a great thing. Yeah, and I've I've heard nothing. I've I've heard uh you probably know Bobby Booz who was with Sabian for years. So yes. Yes. He's he's sort of their A and R guy now and I get emails from him saying they're progressing and everything's coming along and I just don't know what the status of it is as far as Ezo selling the company or what the circumstance is and in those case scenarios the only thing I'm skeptical of is that if things are sold, does somebody come in and start degrading the manufacturing to save money? You know, I don't know. Yes, that, yeah, I hear you on that. All right, well, it's all it, it's all in the works. We're going to find out. I was going to say, I'm going to turn this back over to Robin because she just picked up a weapon. So, Uh-oh. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, but thank you, Eddie. Thank you a million for answering those okay, questions. Yeah, I great, appreciate great it. Great talking with you. You too. So... I want to change gears here for a little bit because you're one of the guys that um, I've always looked up to as having sort of this amazing positive attitude. And you've actually lived through more heartbreak in my life, your life, than I, than 12 people I know. So, I mean... You you lost your mom and your sister when you were young, then your son later on. And, and I want to know how you've managed to weather it without going down a deep rabbit hole, Eddie. Well, uh, a lot of it is, is inner self. A lot of it is your own inner self faith and understanding that uh, this is a temporal life. Uh, the other side of that is There are uh, circumstances where I have seen in the past people become victims Mm. because of their heartbreak, because of their loss and things. And, you know, uh, it's it's a matter of that you play the cards you're dealt. And and you've got to have your own common sense to be able to say, what good is it? for me to destroy myself over something I have no control over. Hmm. And not only that, what inspiration can I be for somebody else by weathering these storms and getting through them and try to give a positive outlook to this life? Because none of us are getting out of this alive. Yep. So <clears throat> so I think it's important for, for everybody within to be able to search themselves and understand if if they do believe that their lost ones live on. Yeah. If they believe that, then they need to understand then that that circumstance is alive. I mean, that that person is alive and well in another dimension, in another uh, scenario, and they need to understand how does that look them seeing you. Yeah you know, either destroying yourself Mm -hmm. because in a sense that's selfishness. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I wasn't going to allow it to do. I remember walking out of the hospital morgue when my son was there Mm. and I knew when I opened the door, I said, I am not going to be that. I am going to live in tribute to this life that I was given for these years. And I will look forward to uh, uh, being with him again. Yeah. And the other side of it was I wasn't going to be any different than I am other than the fact that, yes, this happened. You don't 
stop mourning. You don't stop thinking about the void. Yeah. But the main thing is, is that I'm not going to be something that is going to destroy myself over. I'm not going to, you know, uh, anesthetize my brain with drugs or alcohol or, you know, or just become some manic depressive or whatever, you know. And and I realize it does happen because I know some people that has happened to. I know. And, and, and I've and, always and, uh, yeah. looked up to you. I mean, I've always... Oh, well, thank you, Robin. ...seen you as... I, I guess everybody yeah. has to deal... Everybody has to deal accordingly. And all I know is that's just the way I have to... I kept my focus. And some people have even said, well, you just haven't mourned yet. You haven't cried. You haven't done a... And, of course, that is an immediate response of saying, you do not <laughs> judge me. Yeah, right. You do not tell me what I have done and what I haven't right. done. right. Right. You know. Right. So, well, all I, I am, I'm the, yeah. I'm the exemplary of what I've become through it. I've become stronger. And, uh. Yep. I, I just, you're an amazing testament to somebody oh, who has, has gone through hell and you've managed to keep your feet on the ground and, you know, lived your life. And, and I, and my hat is, off to you, my friend. I oh, Robin, yeah, mine you've been too. such a big part, and you still are such a big part of my life. Well, the greatest memories I have, uh, I can thank you for. Well, with with your talent, your capability, when you were writing articles on me, and I'll never forget the the, the famous call when you called me with, from Modern Drummer, <laughs> and. And I said, Robin, how is it? And and she said, you're going to be on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> well, I that was one of one of the one of the most precious moments that I had. Really, working for them was getting that to happen. Well, you did it. I was and and proud I, I of could that. never I could I I I never had such a champion such as you've been in my life well, and uh, I I love you and I love you too I wish Eddie. you and Ed and everything that you're doing now and you know amazingly enough we're we're here after all these years well, yeah <laughs> yeah I I one of my my mantras is El, uh, Elton's song I'm still standing. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, sometimes I wonder how, but I am. And, and you know, I never even realized that it, at one point you were living out of your car. Yeah, absolutely. I, I Several times. I mean. I lived out of, <sighs> yeah, in Oakland I lived out of it <clears throat> for a while. And then uh, basically when I came back here in late 73, I'll never forget a friend of mine got me uh, on a session to play B3 with uh, Buddy Killen producing. And Buddy came over. He said, man, he said, I'm going to be using you some more. He said, you play great. He said, so uh, how, how long have you been here? I said, well, I just got here not a few months ago. He goes, well, where are you living? I said, the second rest area past Percy oh, Street. <laughs> Uh, and in those days, there were no cell phones, so it's like, how do I reach you? No, no, absolutely not. I go, I'll come in town and check in. Yeah, uh, so it was interesting, you know. Of course, he was gracious and gave me a little money, and uh, you know, so a lot of a lot of great memories, a lot of great people that you know along the way. Yeah, the supportive, you know. Yeah, it's it's an amazing life, isn't it? It's, uh, yep, and we're not done yet. Oh Robin. gosh! Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's more to come. Uh oh. So, so this this recent award you got, what was this? What's that? The recent award you got, what was this? Rec the recent? Uh, <laughs> well, boy, over. Let me see. Of course, several years back, they put me in the Country Music Hall of Fame, National Cats. Yes. That's where they take musicians and tribute them. And then, uh, I guess it was a, was a, not too long ago, actually, maybe two or three years ago, uh, Berkeley School of Music gave me uh, a master's award. Yes. 
Yeah, and uh, actually during that same time, I think I might have got my 14th Academy of Country Music Drummer <laughs> Award. Oh, yeah, yeah, you pig. Yeah. <laughs> Had to build another room just to put those things up. <laughs> and, yeah, I tell and, you. And this current one, this one that you just got, what now? What was that? Huh? You just got something else recently. I did. Yeah, it was. That, oh, you're talking about the the spotlight? Yes. Yes, yes. The the, the country music hall of fame spotlight in me, and uh, that was to come in and uh, perform. You know, just a, another honoring. And so uh, I diversified. I said, well, one thing I'm not going to do anymore, I'm not coming in and doing an hour solo. <laughs> I said, you people would be walking out after 10 minutes. An hour? Jeez. So, so I put in I put in what I considered like a diversified show. I brought in, uh, of course, you know, Lane, my wife, Lane Brody. Mm-hmm. And she, she actually, she has a star on the Walk of Fame there in, uh, in country music. But... Mm. Uh, she did the Yellow Rose of Texas and did a great rendition of that. Then I brought Steve Gibson, who I've known for 43 years here. Mm. And he did sort of like a little uh, Chet Atkins piece, and I did a hand snare to that. And then, uh, amazingly, over the past six or seven months, I have come to know a great uh, mountain Celtic banjo player named Mike Snyder, who's a Grand Ole Opry star. Mm. And he put together some virtuosos. I'm telling you what, I've never had more joy and fun playing with them. I just bring a snare out like old traditional times. So I brought them on the show as well. And it was just such uh, such a hoot. Wow. wow. Yeah. And uh Well, I'm glad yeah. you're I'm glad you're getting your your accolades and your respect and as it should be. And I'm so glad that we had this chance to catch up a little bit, and um, we don't get to, we just don't get to talk enough, and this life is passing us by, Eddie, so. With uh, that, can I, can I yeah, ask oh, Eddie one, one oh, last question? Oh, here we go again. <laughs> Eddie, okay. you don't mind, do you? <laughs> it's, uh, I was just curious, because you, you were mentioned just bringing a snare drum out and, and playing. And you loved it. I guess you were using wire brushes, maybe hot rods. What? What were no, you? No, I'm using I'm using some plastics. Plastics. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, well, just sort of on that line. But years ago, I saw you on a music show. I don't remember who what show, but I do remember you were backing Winona Judd. And I remember. Yeah. I don't know what song, but it was a song that would have had you just playing a snare drum as a conga. And it, That's exactly right. Okay. And it really seemed to me, I think you may have told me this years ago, but, you know, I'm older now, so um, not as cute, and I don't remember things. <laughs> so I was going to say, was there a thing that you were using to effectively get, like, a slap sound out of, out of the snare, out of the, you know? Actually, painstakingly, it was one of your fingers rim-shotting the snare. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's almost like you would do on a kunga without the slap. You had to do it with your finger. So you maybe your index finger, you mean, and you're just sort of laying it on the the yeah, the yeah. Snap. And if you if you kind of batten down the head, and right. Slap that with your index, you'll hear the pop. Amazing. I never. I've heard stories. Guys have said how they put coins in their fingers and they do all this other kind of stuff. And I've tried that, but that didn't seem to work too well for me. I know that if you do mute the head, like you're saying with your hand a little bit and whack the, whack the end of the snare uh, toward the rim. Yeah, that, that does happen. But that thing just always impressed me. It sounded so great. And I was always of the thought process that, you know, you'd use the authentic drum and there's no way to replicate that, but you did a great job. It sounded, yeah. it you sounded know what, amazing. You know what it would be? It'd be liking to hit in the top, Tone of the bongo. Oh, you know really? How you okay. would use that finger to slap it. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's the same thing. But, but, but was just your make would, sure that you don't just make sure you don't have a sharp rim on that. I snare. would. That's what I was. That's what I was going to ask you. <laughs> your next finger will be laying severed. Because you would have been keeping time on mm. two and ow. <laughs> so, but I just wanted to you know compliment you about that because I never forgot it was oh, one of one of those you. things. Yeah. 
Thank you, Ed. You got it. Rob, anything? Okay. anything? <laughs> I know she looks at me like, no, what, are you, what are you talking I, I about? I want to let this poor man go and have his dinner, and I want to tell him how much I love him again, and thank you so much, Eddie, and again, not enough not enough contact with you in the last many years and and i just want to say thank you for being here with us and um oh robin thank you and if you get yes. out to california please don't forget to say hey and um and i want to thank everybody for tuning in and to check my facebook page for upcoming shows we have some promises on the table but no quite hard dates can yet. You, can you say who the, we're just working on? Because uh, I actually did in the chat feature. On oh, the, you did? Okay. Oh, yeah. You, well, uh, we have a promise from Mike Baird and um, and a, cu- a couple of other maybes. So just to keep checking back and um, and that's what's going on, everybody. And again, thank you, Eddie. Um, Maybe Eddie will come back at some point yeah, in the future and yeah, we'll do this again. Absolutely. Plenty to talk about. It. Big hugs and kisses, and we're signing out. Thank you, Eddie. Okay, we're signing off. Thank you so much, both of you. Talk to you soon.